Uh, good day, everybody from uh, Montenegro. It is my pleasure to chair this session on this very interesting uh, conference. And uh, do hope that we will have also interesting presentation and uh, provocative discussion on this session from our uh, speakers. So, uh, in this session, first speaker uh, uh, is coming from Belgrade, from Institute for International Politics and Economics Research Fellow, Mr. Miloš Petrovic. It is my pleasure to give you a floor, and uh, Miloš will uh, talk to you more about famous European perspective. So, please, Miloš, now it's your time. Maybe we need to wait a few seconds for the presentation, or you. Uh, I can uh, I can proceed with uploading the presentation. I'll, I'll share it with you. Okay. I hope that you can all hear me, and I'll just ask for your kind confirmation whether you can see the presentation, since I haven't operated with this specific platform before. Okay. So. So I've tried to share the presentation. Starting to share, yes, we are in the pipeline. Okay, now great. we can see it. Okay, we can see it. Great. So uh, the topic of my presentation, as you can see, is resembling the European perspective in the environment and, and neighborhood policies. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank the organizers first for um, uh, letting me speak first. It's a great pleasure to take part in this conference. Re regrettably, it hasn't been uh, held physically in Athens as we all hoped initially, but uh, still I'm also looking to some fruitful discussion, discussion afterwards with you. So. Uh, to begin, uh, my uh, research problem uh, is that the terms such as the European perspective, European choice, uh, and so on, are being applied in both the enlargement and neighborhood policies, regardless of the fact that these are two distinct policies, two separate policies. And uh, such usage, such terms have evolved into growingly vague political designations. This vagueness, as I argue, has a political purpose and reflects the EU's reluctance to deepen relations with either regions, or whether it would be the region belonging to the uh, neighborhood policy or uh, the uh, region belonging to the enlargement policy. So uh, my aims are to analyze the differences in understanding and inter interpreting the concept of uh, European perspective and similar concepts, which are used in uh, the EU's political discourse, both for the uh, Western Balkans and uh, countries belonging to the neighborhood policy, such as, for example, the Eastern Partners, because the Eastern Partnership is the sort of say most advanced uh, part of the privileged partnership, which the EU has yet developed for, for the neighborhood region. And although the EU applies similar approach to the, these two distinct regions in order to, to transform them according to its own model, I hypothesize that uh, this overlapping between these two distinct policies actually represents a symptom of the lowered EU ambitions for all of its geographic neighborhood. Uh, the working hypotheses uh, are the following, that the, there's a disrespect for boundaries between the two policies, which is a result of the lower EU ambitions for further political expansion, uh, especially in the Western Balkans. This inadequate approach, as I argue, has two main outcomes. Firstly, the notion of European perspective no longer stands exclusively for, for EU membership, but also for the privileged partnership, as seen in the, in the Eastern neighborhood. Secondly, the, uh, both the Western Balkan countries and the Eastern neighbors are uh, increasingly being subjected to the similar logic, uh, to the similar criteria, similar standards, similar instruments. And there is also another common feature, the reluctance to consider EU membership for either region in the near future. Uh, of course, this is not only contrary 
to the uh, al already recognized EU membership perspective for the Western Balkans, but, but is also raising some inadequate expectations in the Eastern neighborhood. These inadequate expectations are, as I argue, largely connected to the EU's own internal incoherence and the lack of political vision of how to handle these two uh, regions. So the European perspective, I've, I've chosen this uh, specific notion as a symbol of this entire vagueness. We, we've heard this uh, term many times in all of the bureaucratic, political and other documents. And uh, as I've come to realize terms such as the European perspective have uh, become growingly vague. Uh, so as, as we've all uh, studied and read about, uh, the Thessaloniki summit in 2003 was a game changer for the Western Balkans. The region was uh, moved from the external policy and included into the enlargement policy. And that happened in parallel with the, uh, with the flow of the Eastern enlargements. Uh, and another thing also happened in parallel, that is the uh, EU's decision to deepen relations with its Eastern neighborhood whom it now bordered. So it needed to develop, uh, develop a specific uh, concept on how to, uh, how to attract them, how to deepen cooperation with them. So hence the Eastern Partnership, which was established in 2009. And here we have uh, already in the Prague Declaration, the examples of, of, uh, of this terminology, the acceleration of uh, political integration, the deepening of economic integration between the two sides. All of these terms sound almost or exactly like uh, the enlargement policy terminology. Also, we have uh, uh, similar examples from the Warsaw Declaration, uh, which acknowledges the European aspirations, the European choice, and those who seek an ever closer relationship with the EU. What is the ever closer relationship with the EU in the context of, of the neighborhood policy? And how does it differ from the ever closer relationship in the enlargement policy? So here, here we have uh, of some, some kind of sort of say flirtation of the EU with the enlargement uh, policy terminology applied for the Eastern Partnership, which is also something that I've um, that I've researched for my PhD dissertation, which dealt uh, specifically with the political outcomes for the Eastern Partnership. Uh, we only see some uh, changes following the uh, 2015, when some more fundamental change, changes in the European neighborhood policies have occurred. Meanwhile, association agreements were signed with uh, uh, post-Soviet uh, Eastern European countries. So uh, from then onwards, we have this less ambiguous terminology, which is more, more suitable uh, to that context, to the neighborhood context on the one hand and enlargement context on the other hand. However, uh, essentially there, there is still this vagueness and there is the fundamental issues remain that uh, instead of uh, instead of having two separate political visions we have it appears as if we have only one for both regions an example is uh, a single uh, european portfolio for two policies there is uh, there used to be two now there, there is only one the enlargement and neighborhood policy uh, portfolio and uh, on the other hand we also have uh, this year specifically we have this new adopted newly adopted uh accession negotiations methodology which may uh contribute to refocusing uh the negotiations better for the candidate countries so uh, these these two uh changes uh changes in the ENP and methodology represent step in the good direction although problems still remain and uh, they need to be strategically addressed in the following years. In terms of theoretical considerations, we have uh, this, uh, as I argue, you interest in uh, neoliberal restructuring, uh, which is uh, with the goal to bring them uh, 
to bring uh, the Western Balkans close to EU membership, to meet the criteria, to satisfy the, the criteria. This is something uh, which has been uh, written about by uh, professors Sipakis and Fakiloas and uh, Dr. Yeager and, and many other uh, also scholars. So we have this interest for the Western Balkans to get them to meet the criteria, but uh, I also think that uh, there's a similar logic for the Eastern Partnership. There's, uh, this can also, uh, this theory can also be applied for both because the two policies have been tied together by the EU. Uh, the EU also use, applies its normative power to encourage transformative processes in the two regions. And there's also the social constructivist uh, touch where whereas the there's this belief in European integration uh, in uh, in the political elites which influences uh, their pro political behavior what are my basic findings uh, that uh, on one hand the Eastern partnership uh, represented uh, uh, a manifestation of the increased uh, geopolitical ambitions of the EU for the post-Soviet Eastern Europe. And on the other hand, uh, in parallel, we have this decreased geopolitical interest for the Western Balkans. Uh, it has become, uh, the session process in the Western Balkans has become growingly unattractive, and that happened especially uh, during this past decade, uh, which has seen many challenges. Uh, in the function of the EU, and also there was also closer insight into democratic deficiencies in uh, in the modern uh, in the today's Eastern member states. Uh, also, we have this uh, uh, less encouragement from the EU uh, for the transformative processes in the Western Balkans. Uh, the EU was more. Uh, more active in that regard uh, when it came to previous Eastern enlargements. Uh, so, and uh, the primary uh, concern has been stability, hence, as we all know, the stabilocratic logic, uh, which uh, burdens the developments in the region until this day. Uh, uh, still, we have uh, the application of the of the same terminology as I've already mentioned. Uh, for Serbia, for example, we have a clear European perspective, whereas Moldova, which is an Eastern partner, is praised for its European choice and steps towards ever closer relationship, which is uh, which is confusing to say the least. Uh, these terminological distinctions are very subtle uh, and they have been designed in a way to uh, make use of the pro-European sentiments in the region in order to uh, use it as a context for continuing of the Europeanization processes in the region. Uh, unfortunately, there is a reluctance uh, to consider EU membership for either the Western Balkans, whom the membership perspective has been promised, or for, for the uh, Eastern uh, Eastern Partnership Partnership region, which which doesn't have a recognized uh, membership perspective, uh, but uh, have but its political elites uh, have inadequate or and non-realistic expectations, which uh, is uh, also EU's fault to a large degree. Conclusion: I, I will not repeat the the points which I've just said. I'll just uh, I'll, I'll try to make it quick. Uh, on one hand, we have uh, the Eastern Partnership, which has assumed geopolitical focus uh, during the past decade, uh, whereas on the other hand, the Western Balkans has slided down on the list of uh, EU's priorities due to its own decreased geopolitical. Uh, importance. Uh, we have uh, the less uh, less encouragement, less stimulation from the EU uh, for the Western Balkans comparing to the previous enlargement. Uh, we have the stabilocratic issue, which which is uh, a byproduct of of such approach. Uh, 
we have the fact that the two distinct policies have been tied together by the EU and now uh, there is a necessity to untangle them and to treat them as two separate policies in, instead of just uh, two policies which were merged together de facto uh, by, by the EU. Currently, and according to the pace so far, to me it appears that the slow motion and partial integration uh, appear to be the EU's governing logic, at least up until now, and that has proven to be uh, largely ineffective, at least in the case of the Western Balkans. Uh, the resources which I've used range from uh, the uh, bureaucratic and uh, EU documents over scientific articles to uh, the political national documents, academic NGO and, and other sources. Thank you very much for for your attention, and I'm open to a fruitful discussion afterwards. Thank you, Mr. Petrovic, for your interesting uh, presentation. And uh, I can really agree with your explanation that there are some kind of confusion between those uh, terminologies, uh, starting for the first with second time name of our um, commission director that general for the enlargement and neighborhood policy, and then what does it really mean, European perspective, from the perspective of our region, and how it is now even more closer towards the eastern neighborhood. So we will follow discussion later. And now I will uh, give the floor to our next uh, topic. It is Professor Fatiolas with the depolitization or repolitization of EU enlargement policies, some reflections. Professor, please, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Professor Durovic, for giving me the floor. Uh, besides, thank to the organizer. I will, I'm very pleased that uh, you chair this uh, session. And um, uh, to, I'm also very pleased that uh, I have this opportunity to uh, share my reflection uh, with uh, and distinguish uh, with a panel uh, consisting of distinguished uh, sp uh, speakers. So, at present, the European Union engaged in the Western Balkans, as you know, by and large through the process of enlargement. And uh, unless it, it, it is a sovereign debt crisis or the Greek uh, Turkish dispute nowadays, it's enlargement that most often make headline in EU debates. For one thing, over the past decade, EU enlargement has been one of the most central and recurrent topics in public discussion and debates in uh, member states on the EU. So why does this question occupy our thoughts and attention as much from a purely scholarly point of view as from a policy perspective? Two years ago, from this very floor, at a conference uh, convened by the same organizer, then uh, uh, live, now uh, online, I had the opportunity to argue uh, that uh, enlargement uh, as a policy was dead. Today, as uh, I still uh, believe that this uh, argument uh, holds uh, true, I would like to expand this argument and uh, share with you some uh, and reflect on some other dimensions of this uh, argument. To remind this uh, my old argument, from the side of the EU, what exists is a strategy for enlargement, in the sense that enlargement as an activity of planned action of getting things done is less political and more procedural, reflecting a technocratic business as user. In fact, what we enlargement policy today is rather a process reflecting business as usual than a policy. It is part and it part and parcel of an institutional process under the guidance and supervision of EU bureaucracy, the Brussels bureaucracy. In other words, enlargement on its own is an administrative uh, procedure of technocratic nature. Indeed, all EU documents, including those released almost a week ago, for instance, the Economic and Investment Plan for the Western Balkans or the New Green Deal for Western Balkans, in addition to reconfiguring the European perspective of the Western Balkans and, of course, enhancing their accession process, 
detail not only the progress made so far, but also what is left to be done and how a candidate country can become a member of the EU, but in a way that it is both to the benefit of the EU wider political objective and in concert, of course, with the rules and norms that the EU seeks to promote. From this perspective, uh, in short, EU documents give the impression that they are a user manual, an instruction book. And what does this mean? Simply, at least to my, uh, uh, in my opinion, it means, or uh, uh, the political implication, is that EU functionaries and uh, senior officials must be let get on their job free of intervention free of political in interference by other member states or other stakeholders. In other words, the message that EU bodies convey to us all is that the Brussels bureaucracy must be left free to operate and conduct enlargement at, ma at arm's length from politics. Once the end and the technical procedure of enlargement are declared and sent in motion, politicians, stakeholders, and all the rest should, should set themselves aside until the conditions are fully met and the results are delivered. This is one side of the coin, I do believe. The other side is that the EU keeps reinforcing rather than relaxing the centrality of conditionality. The paradox here is that the more the EU puts pressure on the Western Balkans to push forward to confess, of course, with much needed domestic reform, the more the reforms are opposed and resisting both by the, the candidate countries and their society. In order to overcome this complexity, the EU, as you know, has set time and technical compliance benchmark in a way that in reality they have the enlargement process of each political responsibility, or the European Commission itself deprived it of its political responsibility. Put it differently, the political crux of decision making with regard to the enlargement process is removed. The political, that is, policy and politics, are magically left out of the picture. For many scholars and analysts, including me, this is a standard example of depoliticization. But again, this state of affairs, I mean depoliticization, gives birth to another problem, which moves the EU to the other end of the spectrum. No matter what the intention or the expectation of the European Commission are, the EU member state and their society keep demanding the right to command the whole process of accession. From this angle, the move of France in December, in past December, to veto the onset of uh, EU accession negotiation with North Macedonia and Al Albania was nothing else than an effort to renew or even reestablish the rules of their enlargement game by bringing the state back in at the expense of EU institutions. This for me, it is a, a classic example of politicization. So, altogether, what is actually what actually is at stake? I do believe that uh, both politicization, uh, that is an attempt to ring fence enlargement from politics, has resulted in the opposite outcome. It has made enlargement an object of politicization. In fact, wait just a minute of politicization, which includes the question of whether a candidate country should be in the EU, whether the benefit, what are the benefit and cost of membership, both for the candidate country and for the member state of the EU, and of course, what is the geographical, the adequate geographical reach of the EU. To set forth my argument in a straightforward manner, no matter how much salient EU enlargement is, or how much different Europeans are toward EU enlargement, are indifferent are toward, uh, toward EU enlargement, the gist of the matter is that enlargement involves, revolves around, and is in fact about EU politics and policy. From this angle, we have to make clear that whether the functioning of the EU 
can be seen and reflecting of model of intercompartment or a model of supranationalism or a model of multi-level government. Enlargement or cares and take place through and by a political democratic competition at the level both of the EU and each, each member state, and of course at the levels of a uh, candidate country. In this context, the question is how can we detect and define the politicization and politicization in a way that we don't rob them of meaning? But what exactly does it mean for EU enlargement to have become politicized? To begin with, despite its popularity, the concept of politicization remains elusive and controversial. There is no universally accepting definition of this. In principle, defined in the most general term, I understand polar, polar, polarization, politicization, excuse me, uh, to be associated with deviation from some normal behavior to which the EU and the Western Balkan states are expecting to conform. And what is this normal uh, behavior? According to my view, this normal behavior relates to policy and politics, would relate to the arena of policy, to everyday policy and politics. In practice, politicization can be seen as a deviation from, technocrat from, te from technocratic policy making and depoliticization the other way around as an attachment to technocratic policy making. This brings us to the question of what is politics. I see politics as a deliberate attempt, either cooperative or competitive or conflictive, at making collectively binding decisions for a group of people. The attempt is made in a public sphere, that is, a political space by those involved in the decision-making process that is both who govern and those who are subject to governance in a given legally constituted polity. In this respect, an issue is politicized if and when it is raised by those involved in decision-making as a bone of contention, as an irreconcilable difference. Here. At least in my view, politicization represents not a practice of just competitive claims making, but a practice of completely different and irreconcilable claims making. It is about a cleavage among parties involved. From this perspective, from this angle, for an issue to turn into a politicized one and by extension evolve into a state of affairs, a deliberate decision must be taken by an actor willing to instrumentalize the political uh, to its benefit. This in turn implies that uh, implies setting the agenda that is making the preferred issue top priority on the political agenda. And again, to do this, that is to set the uh, agenda, an actor should provide its own interpretation of this issue, that is to frame the issue by defining and presenting it as a relevant pro problem. This way, as this issue is picked up the, by, the mean, by the media of all sorts, the issue becomes salient in public debate and as a result, polarize the public opinion. But all this process is highly political because the end of all those involved in decision making and incenting, including uh, agenda sending, frame, and so on, is to keep retaining control over political development. Likewise, on the, uh, on the other end of the spectrum, depoliticization is again the attribute of an actor and its action. Again, for an issue to turn into a depoliticized one and by extension involve in a state of affairs, deliberate decision must be taken by an actor willing this time to deny the political, not to instrumentalize the political, the political to its benefit. This is why again setting the agenda, but this time by making the prepared issue a matter of low priority. This entails in practice that public policy responsibilities and action are transferred away from all majoritarian institutions uh, and from the state, of course, and are attached to expert and technocratic ruling. And technocratic ruling, this means to technocracy. But again, technocracy is not immune to the political. 
simply because it grows by expertise within the boundaries set by politics. To remind you of Giovanni Sartori's dictum, a government issue of expert or of a technocrat is, of course, admissible. In regard, however, to means, not in regard to ends. Ends are set by politicians. So, to come full side, the recent French attempt at politicizing EU enlargement, there is no deny that Bre uh, has uh, brought the state back in. Thereby, seemingly, apparently, it progressed in the governmental coordination and cooperation. But at the same time, I do believe that it, the, the very, uh, uh, this uh, French attempt can be seen from the other side of the coin, that it may equally break the ground for EU supranational institutions, especially the European Commission, to renew, to renew their political leadership role beyond the boundaries of our technocracy. And of course, this presupposes that the European Commission, uh, the Commissioner, would realize of this uh, fact and to take the step uh, to this uh, end. And uh, to remind you another uh, dictu dictum, it is politics stupid. Thank you for your attention, I'm, and I'm waiting for your question in the question-answer uh, session. Thank you, Professor Fakiolas, for your very interesting presentation and uh, trying to explain a very complex uh, issue to make distinctions between those two processes, such as uh, depolitization and uh, before that politization. So let's uh, let's try to discuss it uh, later after all presentations with the do hope one uh, short uh, circle additionally so uh, according to our schedule we have uh, mr Ale alexander Hleba with us uh, with the topic uh, the revised methodology of the enlargement policy old wine in new bottles so very interesting uh, topic and uh, Mr. Kleba came from uh, Warsaw, from Poland. So, do we have them on the contact, or we will Professor have some here. replacement? No, no, I'm here. Thank you. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I can't see. Please, yes, thank you please for the floor is yours. Me. Okay. Yes, okay. I would like to share the presentation, but I still can see the screen. Oh, now it's now it's fine. So I'll just now share the presentation. Um, that I have prepared. I hope now you can see it. So, um, first of all, I'm also uh, honored to be part of this panel and to, to listen to uh, perspectives on the Balkans coming from effectively from different regions from of Europe, uh, which I think enriches our own uh, outlooks on, on how the the EU and, and the Balkans um, to cooperate uh, with the aim of, of eventual uh, membership. So uh, the topic is the revised methodology of the EU's enlargement policy, uh, old wine in new bottles. Uh, the, the title which can uh, already spur a discussion whether there is something new or it's just yet another political declaration stating that yes, we need to foster credibility, we need to work harder, uh, countries, Western Balkan countries need to deliver on the on, on the reforms. EU member states have to be credible in what they say about the enlargement perspective. So does it really bring something new into the process or it is uh, simply a political uh, declaration? If you look at the research uh, question, these are, these are the ones that I have identified. So why was the revision of the enlargement policy methodology? Uh, proposed uh, in the first place, but also quite specifically why in 2019, then to what extent does it address the identified flaws of the enlargement process and then how will it affect, affect the Western Balkans EU integration and some of the hypotheses that I had at the beginning of, of prior to the research uh, being done was that uh, first a hypothesis indeed they were probably some major drawbacks of the enlargement policy that had to be uh, worked on uh, in order to improve the process. 
Then a second hypothesis, the revision was used by some EU member states uh, that were opposed to opening uh, of accession talks with North Macedonia and Albania to justify their position. Uh, the third one is a uh, rather general one, is that the EU member states' stance on enlargement depends on their internal political agenda and therefore timing of a council vote is crucial. Um, I will now switch the slide. EU enlargement history, um, uh, this may seem to be a rather general slide on the EU enlargement history, but uh, the only aim of it is to show that uh, after the first round of enlargement in 1973, there has not been a period of 10 consecutive years when no country entered the EU. If you look at the figures, it was 8, 5, 9, 9, 3, 6. Now, since 2013, we are already in 2020, <clears throat> and the um, prospected membership, uh, as, as was outlined in 2018, would be 2025, which means uh, more than 10 years meaning 12 years after Croatia joined the EU, but even 2025 is not uh, certain. Uh, why it is important for the EU? Well, EU is praising itself uh, for the enlargement policy as the, the success of its foreign policy. So it itself claims that the enlargement policy brought the reunification of Europe uh, in the Big Bang uh, enlargement in 2004. It uh, enables the EU to <clears throat> have leverage on, on some of the transformations, political and economic, uh, in Europe. And therefore, it seems uh, that the EU treats it seriously and would like it to prosper. But what we can see even from these days is that for now, uh, since Croatia's uh, accession, it is uh, stalled. Also, if you look at the at the names of the portfolios that the respective commissioners have had, uh, these, the, the two preceding ones and, and, and this one, there have been different discussions on to what extent the name of the portfolio and the, the order of, 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 of these two policies, neighborhood and enlargement, to what extent they reflect uh, actually the seriousness with which the Commission approaches uh, enlargement at a particular point of time. Because for Stefan Fühle, uh, Czech um, uh, Commissioner, uh, back then it was enlargement and European neighborhood policy, so enlargement as such and in the first place. But then for Johannes Hahn, the one uh, from Austria, it was the other way around, European neighborhood policy and enlargement negotiations. So not enlargement, but enlargement negotiations. Does it mean we just do uh, negotiations on enlargement, but there is no enlargement, enlargement as such? And now the new commissioner uh, from Hungary uh, got the portfolio of neighborhood and enlargement. So there may also be a speculation to what extent this means that now, since negotiations has disappeared as a, no, as a noun in, in the title, we have the enlargement coming back on the um, Commission agenda. But we also know that uh, this uh, von der Leyen's Commission is geopolitical commission. So if we look, for instance, at the um, communication of the Commission to other institutions on this revised methodology, um, it states that maintaining and enhancing the enlargement policy is indispensable for the EU's credibility, for the EU's success and for the EU's influence in the region and beyond, especially at times of heightened geopolitical competition. So uh, it was, I think, in 2018 when the Commission openly said that um, integration of the Balkans into the EU is in its own security and economic interest uh, of the EU, but now there is also this uh, this point on, on the geopolitical competition in, in place and what, what's meant by it is also the vacuum that can indeed um, um, occur in the Balkans and, and then there are some other actors eager to uh, fill this vacuum. But if you look at the enlargement process as um, some of the previous colleagues have already uh, mentioned, um, it has become a largely uh, bureaucratic process with a stringent uh, conditionality, conditionality that is becoming stricter and stricter, yet credibility of it, I would say, is, is rather diminished. So if you look at how many years it took for some countries to join the EU in the past, so especially the fifth and the sixth way here, so eight years for, let's say, Slovenia or Czechia, uh, so Slovenia also post-Yugoslav state, but uh, already joined in 2004, then for Croatia, 10 years. But if you look now at the Western Balkan countries in the process, for Albania, it's already 11 years, Serbia, 11, Montenegro, 12, North Macedonia, 16 years. The, the, the first country in the region 
except of course for Slovenia to conclude this stabilization and association agreement, which was back then a front runner in the region because of the name dispute, uh, infamous one with Greece, uh, has basically now been overcome already by Croatia, part of the EU, Serbia and, and Montenegro, and is now at the same stage as, as Albania. So now if you look in 2019, since I'm looking at the revised methodology and why it was proposed in the first place, so all of the emblems and, and flags here uh, are relevant. Uh, since we, we are all uh, working on the Balkans, I will not go much into detail to uh, what happened. But it is important to see how, why 2019 was such a crucial point and why this uh, revised methodology was not proposed, let's say, one year earlier or two years earlier, because problems that seem to have been identified did not occur in 2019. They have been already there a number of years. So just to a recap of some of the developments, so there was a historic deal between Greece and back then still former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia on the uh, the agreement on the name um, name solution so the name of north macedonia was uh, was uh, agreed upon and there was a constitutional change there was also a referendum in uh, in in that country in, in in north macedonia and of course all eu leaders were supportive of the process saying that this is a milestone towards eu accession of of the country but also nato membership and also albania with uh, some reforms in the judiciary both countries have received uh, the, rec the recommendations from the Commission several times when it comes to North Macedonia. Since 2009, um, Commission has been uh, recommending the Council to open negotiation talks. So it's already for a decade that, that uh, in, in a way, Mace uh, North Macedonia is waiting for that decision. But of course, there was this veto of, of the Greek government. Uh, but with Albania, the same European Commission has uh, recommended several times to open negotiations back then in 2019. First in June, there was a summit and then the decision was postponed uh, till October. And then we know that in October uh, it was uh, blocked uh, by, by France, uh, Denmark and the Netherlands. Uh, later on, there was a resolution of the European Parliament saying that uh, the decision was wrong and the European Parliament fully supports the EU integration of the Balkans and it calls upon the member states and the uh, EU institutions to open negotiations as soon as possible. Um, interestingly enough, also there were uh, the, the former president of Commission, Juncker, also commented on this, saying that it was a historic mistake, even though he himself at the beginning of his mandate said there would not be any accession uh, when he is in office. Um, that was uh, in, I think, 2015. Uh, also, uh, President Tusk um, and even Prime Minister Bulgaria, Borisov, said that it was a mistake. And uh, he also said that even if we had opened uh, the, the uh, negotiations already in October, Bulgaria would still have 80 occasions to veto uh, the membership of any of those two countries. Uh, so it was not a loss at all. So uh, it could have been prevented. So opening a negotiations in the first place would not have meant uh, immediate membership of, of those uh, two countries in question. Now, if you look at what, uh, Professor, uh, what President Macron was saying about the enlargement as such, not only about North Macedonia and Albania, but rather about the whole process. Uh, it's telling, it's telling. Uh, first, uh, there are some quotes. Does the opening of the chapters improve life in Serbia? I would say no. That's why the whole process should be reconsidered. You made the collective mistake declaring the EU membership as our only relationship with the Western Balkans. So this is, this is a statement which, in my opinion, but I also I believe that uh, in, in Balkans it was received the same way, is questioning the credibility of the whole process because one of the main member states when it comes one of the founding member states of the eu also one of the strongest economies and one of the main political players in the eu says that um, western balkans shouldn't have been promised this membership in the first place we should have had more options on the table but now we just have this so we need to continue but it was unwise to do it in the first place. The ultimate goal is to link the Western Balkans, uh, Macron continues, to Europe firmly. Some may see that link in the form of the EU membership, but it should be clear that it means a strategic partnership and more investments. So this message is 
even if we continue with the EU membership, for some, this may be the ultimate goal, but it can also be strategic partnership or some other alternatives. So membership is not the only game in town. Uh, if we read um, President Macron's um, statement this way. And this picture also here with the infamous waiting rooms of the EU, I also like using them. So I, I enjoyed the ones that uh, Professor Fakiolas uh, showed us about uh, Western Balkans, thorny or rocky, or there are different adjectives that are now used to, to the Western Balkans uh, integration to the EU. Uh, also, is, is telling and depicts how uh, complicated the whole process is, since you do not even have this firm credibility of it, even though it is underlined in so many political declarations at, at the EU, EU West and Balkan summits, uh, commission uh, communications, so on and so forth. Um, so then the French non-paper appeared uh, at the end of 2019 uh, under the title Reforming the European Union Accession Process. And what I said uh, was that closer ties between the European Union and the countries of the Western Balkans and their effective accession once the European Union has been reformed and made more effective and responsive for its member states and candidate countries. So here there is this allusion to the so-called absorb absorption capacity of the European Union and there is a call on the EU first to reform itself not only for the candidate countries, but also for the member states. So to be more responsive to, to the crises happening inside, um, inside the EU. And the, what, what was proposed uh, basically was a methodology based on four principles. So gradual association with several successive stages in coherent policy blocks. Um, uh, France identified big than seven. Stringent conditions and then also tangible benefits. Uh, but if you look at that hypothesis that dealing with the internal politics, um, it's interesting to observe that in this tangible benefits part, the non-paper has this quote on uh, on the benefits which are currently lacking and prevent migratory movements from being stemmed, posing problems for both parties. So, uh, as we know, migration is quite often used by Eurosceptic parties across the EU, also by, by Front National, uh, by Marie Le Pen. So having mentioned uh, migration openly in, in this paper also in a way means that uh, that the audience is in France, not in, in Brussels or in the Balkans. Uh, and also the, 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 the reversibility uh, point. Strong political governance with uh, member states involvement in monitoring and sexual policy. So here we, uh, we touch upon politicization of, of the process because uh, France actually wants member states to be involved in the review of the evaluations done by the Commission. So it's not only that Commission does the report and then it's sent to the Council, to, to, to other institutions to take a decision on, but member state uh, experts would need to be involved already at the stage of drafting the evaluation reports uh, when it comes to the to the countries uh, in question, meaning the Western Balkans, which also means that they would receive political leverage on, on the summary, on the conclusions, whether certain benchmarks have, have been met or not. So the Commission, in a way, would then not have this sole jurisdiction on saying that, for instance, North Macedonia, Albania have complied with this or that benchmark or criterion because that this debate from the council level will inevitably go down to this technical level of the experts and they will just do uh, the, their discussions there, which means in a way that this can prolong the process even more. But I will go back to that uh, also in the last part of the presentation. So if we then look, there was a uh, another non-paper, this one suggested by nine member states, um, interestingly enough and understandably coming from the region, well, from Central and Eastern Europe, uh, Austria, Czech Republic, Estonia, it Italy, Lat Latvia, Lithuania, um, Malta, Poland and Slovenia. So it also, this non-paper, uh, which is regrettably not uh, available, I, I tried to, to look it up. I just um, found some of the analysis of it. So the main proposals, um, there was some similarities, of course, but there were also some differences. So these nine countries said that 
Uh, if the EU is to reform the enlargement, it doesn't need to prevent uh, the opening of negotiations with North Macedonia and Albania. They should not be just hold, held hostage of this process. Uh, then they argued for the op just joint opening and closing of negotiation chapters grouped by main areas. So not only opening them in clusters, but also closing them in clusters, which means in a way that instead of five votes on five chapters, you have one vote to open the cluster and one vote to close the cluster rather than five votes to open all individual chapters and five uh, votes to close uh, all of them separately. And then the groups of chapters um, can be negotiated in parallel and not consecutively. So uh, the problem of these nine uh, member states with the French proposal is that if you, for, if you put fundamentals first, and you do all the other clusters only after fundamentals have been dealt with, then, for instance, some countries like Bulgaria and Romania would not have even uh, joined the EU uh, if you would just deal with rule of law in the first place, 23, 24, and only when it's done, you then continue with other chapters. Because as we know with Bulgaria and Romania, there was this first time that there was this post-accession conditionality with the with the verification cooperation ver verification mechanism and i believe that all agree now that it didn't really work this post accession conditionality is much weaker than it is in the pre accession period that's why for the for croatia it was not proposed as such but then we know also that with the benchmarks and uh, fundamentals conditionality was enhanced for croatia so here if we start with fundamentals so by the time we reach chapter 31, for instance, security and uh, foreign and security, foreign, foreign security policy or some other issues, uh, that will take not even decades, but uh, I do not want to be too pessimistic, but when uh, President Macron said that, uh, well, we open negotiations with Turkey now is around 40 years, if, so what does it bring us? So if you do it, uh, cluster by cluster with rule of law, judiciary, the, mo the most demanding ones first, then it will not be even decades, but uh, uh, but but uh, many more years. Um, and um, there was this uh, focus on the imbalance clause. So then this is what we uh, finally received. This was the final uh, outcome. Uh, the European Commission uh, communication. What's interesting, it doesn't answer some of the questions, meaning the differences between the French and the nine member states uh, proposals, because for instance, it doesn't say whether it's going to be consecutively or in parallel. Uh, it did um, uh, adopt the approach of, of having clusters, but then uh, it also uh, took into consideration some of the member states uh, proposals. I mean, this uh, another non-paper. Um, and uh, therefore, we can't really say that it was France who monopolized the whole agenda setting. It was the country that proposed it, but then uh, in, in throughout the negotiations, uh, there were some consensuses made. And so now this is how uh, the Commission uh, looks at the, at the chapters and clusters that have been identified with fundamentals first, internal market competitiveness, green agenda, resources, external uh relations um so uh this is about the uh, reverse methodology i also prepared a part on covid uh because it's relevant i know that i have already run out of time uh, because one of the problems that commission also identifies is a dissonance between the eu and member states how they deal with enlargement where the eu is positive uh, overly positive and then member states uh, uh rather have some of them at least pessimistic views on the enlargement process, so how to speak with one voice. And uh, this, these are some of the figures on how the media in, in, in Serbia, in this particular case, about the media coverage of EU, China and Russia aid during COVID-19 pandemic. Because it's not only about this level of member states, institutions and Western Balkan states, but it's also about the perceptions of the Western Balkan uh, populations, meaning citizens in all of those countries, whether they believe that the EU is the right way to go, given all of the complexity, lack of credibility, so on and so forth. So um, I will just probably go through them very quickly so that I do not take more of, it, of our time. Uh, so 
this graph just shows that uh, in this month when there was this outbreak of pandemic in Europe, especially also in Serbia, uh, with, with China was receiving uh, very positive coverage and EU was criticized more than usual. Um, and Russia was also pretty much uh, positively received. This was because the EU in the first place uh, banned the exportation of medical equipment to, to the Western Balkan countries and it was not decisive how to help the Balkans. Therefore, uh, in terms of media coverage, but also what, for instance, Serb, uh, Serbian government did, of course, they relied on the help that was there. So um, President Vucic even said that um, European solidarity is only on the paper. It's a fairy tale, doesn't exist. So it's only China that provided us with all of the equipment, everything we, we needed. So you, you can see uh, his tweet in a very uh, friendly manner with sisters and brothers and uh, uh, thanking Chinese for the support. Also, Pre uh, Prime Minister Brnabic here uh, uh, then receiving a, a playing with uh, I believe eight doctors, but some equipment from Russia and also the, the, the uh, Mr. Haleba, please, if I, I can am, intervene, yes. uh, please take care about your time limit because of yeah. other colleagues. True, true. So, uh, yeah, I just have, yeah, three slides to go. So when it comes to EU support, it's not only about COVID, but in general, EU invests a lot, but in terms of media coverage and how it is perceived by the citizens in the Balkans, it is problematic for it to be perceived as the one uh, that uh, supports and helps a lot in terms of aid in the region. And uh, in terms of winning hearts and minds, uh, there is a recent uh, poll on to what extent the, the citizens in the region believe that EU is the right uh, choice. In terms of conclusions now, so I believe that revised methodology indeed aims at addressing some of the identified structural weaknesses of the enlargement policy. Its timing was political one uh, rather than uh, rather than merit-based, I would say. And despite several prima facie positive developments, um, the involvement of EU member states in evaluation review can lead to further politicization of the process and vetoes at a much earlier technical level with many skilled media coverage. When there is a council vote, there is everywhere in media, you can follow it and then political elites can be criticized because if they say something and then they do not deliver, but if it happens at this technical level of, of uh, expert groups, then it will probably not be that covered that much. And um, methodology of the process is still subordinated to the political will on both sides, EU and Western Balkans, and credibility is sine qua non here in the process. Uh, so it has to be uh, seen that way. And of course, uh, as it is a political decision after all, uh, I mean, enlargement as such, it depends on the EU member states, um, political agenda and Euroskeptic movements in Europe. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry for not uh, uh, dealing with time management properly. I'm still young in academia, so I will do my best to uh, improve. Thank you. If I may, uh, if I may add as somebody who is quite older, uh, one slide, one minute, so you can calculate it easily to manage your time. Uh, regarding my dear neighbor, Bosnia, they are also four, four years in the process after submission of application, so you should add them on slide number three. And uh, what is also important, if you mentioned those, all those non-papers, which are not uh, transparent uh, and open publicly, uh, maybe I can add only that, for instance, in European Parliament, there were also in the late October resolution, also from friends of our region, from uh, 11 member states. They, they, they were also against uh, uh, postponing a political decision about Macedonia and uh, Albania. And they um, vote uh, pro integration of our region. I think voting was about uh, 420 MPs vote for that. So it was very promising in that uh, quite depressing period for us with the third postponement of decision for North Macedonia and Albania. But in any case, we need to continue. So thank you for your uh, presentation and uh, nice systematization of all important moments uh, towards uh, new methodology. Now we have uh, with us Professor Regis. Please, uh, floor is yours. 
I'm, I'm going to, to, to concentrate in a more general way about enlargement, thinking in, um, in terms of core and non-core members uh, in CSDP. Um, in, in, in that way, I'm, I'm, I'm going to touch this issue about, um, about um, civilian Europe, okay? about civilian, um, uh, civilian power Europe or EU as a civilian power or, um, um, or a, a strong, uh, um, a, a, a militarily strong Europe. Um, now, why do we care about, uh, uh, about, um, about this, um, about the CSDP? Now, CSDP is, 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 is the policy. Um, and then we have the military capability of European Union, which is the which is the, 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 the co a combination of military strengthness of European Union, and then we have CSDP operations. We used to have military operations alone. Um, uh, 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 um, last years we have uh, we have civilian operations as well. Now, what is the core and the non-core, uh, and if there is any, and then what is the relationship between them? Um, the problem is identifying the core is that uh, what, what do we call core? Core is the militarily strong European member states. Now, again, do we, do we need to talk about uh, big or small European states? Yes, I think we, 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 we should. Um, why? Because then we know what is the combined strength in military terms. Again, I ask, give my, 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 own, my own answer. Uh, do we necessarily need to talk about a militarily strong euro? Well, that's, that's a problem about, about, the, the, about, the, about the, the objective of CSDP. Now, we can approach this objective on, on two levels. One level is high standard, the other is low standard. A, house, a high standard level in which we need or we should approach CSDP is that we generate, it's a, it's a kind of a euro group in military terms, um, which is being uh, specified as, uh, as a European Union actually generating a genuine integrated collective European defense system capable of protecting its own territory and citizens independently. If we look at CSDP at that level, which is a high standard level, then who is the core? The core is the big European uh, member states, which are um, European, uh, which are uh, United Kingdom, which is, is now is, is, is no longer with us, um, a question mark, and then maybe it's uh, Germany or it's France. Second level, if we go at a lower level and then um, uh, CSDP is actually about, not really about creating um, a European defense or a truly European defense, as we call it, then maybe European Union is actually preparing itself to play a role in international scheme with, uh, with the capacity for autonomous action backed up with credible military forces, the means to decide and use them, and the readiness to do so. Then what is the core? The core is actually not that level high, but actually is what we call then um, all member states or all those member states who can contribute to this objective. So um, actually is all member states which are actually contributing to CSDP operations, except uh, Denmark, uh, which has opted out, but still rethinking about this, uh, about this, uh, this, uh, this, um, um, <clears throat> this option. Now, what is the what is the what is the leadership in terms of who is actually leading in CSDP terms? First question is: We do do we need a leader? If we go to the to the other to the other um, uh, Euro Atlantic um, um, uh, structure, which is NATO, do we have or have we have we have have we have uh, have we had an, an an agreement within NATO about leadership? Yes, we had the leader. And then all others are actually have been following this leader. But in terms of European Union and European and European integration process, do we have uh, do we have a state which is actually leading, or put it in another way, is the core in CSDP actually leading European defence 
integration or uh, actually leading, giving the impetus in European defense integration? Um, not really. So is, is, is that the problem? In my view, yes, because we need to approach European Union in military terms also, and then we need to have the military strength of the European Union. If we have identified and integrated the core, which is the critical, the critical factor, the, 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 the critical states within European Union acting as leaders within CSDP, then on the other way, we can have this objective of CSDP and then a European Union consequently at a defense and security level, which is then the objective. The objective then is through CSDP missions and operations is more strategic. And um, if we look at PESCO, PESCO is actually the, the, the methodology of, of, of of, of integrating and 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 um, and facilitating the, the the cooperation between member states, but PESCO is actually talking about high demanding missions. High demanding missions in military terms, meaning war operations, classical war operations, meaning uh, integrating, creating, integrating, and sustaining military forces. So then, in my view, we need to know about this parts of European Union public policies, which is the defense policy, the integration, the degree of integration, and then we need to know who is actually leading. If not, if we don't, uh, meaning that if we don't have this, this core specified, if we don't have very, that core uh, clearly def defined, then we don't have this, uh, this, um, uh, this um, defense integration actually happening. If it is not happening, then this is the question, um, do, we, do we need to think in terms of NATO, because NATO is still actually functioning uh, in its way, so uh, actually maybe we, 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 uh, we merge these two uh, European or Euro-Atlantic efforts, or we need to, uh, rather we need to go back and, uh, and uh, uh, revive this European and security defense policy, but in military terms, that means that we need to know the exact military strength of European Union, and then we need exactly to define who is actually leading in CSDP. Otherwise, if you don't have a leader, like actually happening uh, last uh, three years in Trump administration, if you don't have a leader, then you actually have um, a very big question mark in your own uh, way uh, towards the uh, future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor, for um, helping us somehow to share also this important aspect of uh, overall picture of our region, a European perspective, and a uh, new environment, and of course, the whole story about relation between uh, uh, European uh, defense integration and relation with NATO. So, in that, uh, on that path, we will continue with uh, our colleagues and the presentations we have. Uh, so we are now approaching to, la to our last uh, presentation in this session. Uh, we talk about uh, issues of lack of trust, the key obstacle of enlargement. And uh, with us, we have colleagues, uh, uh, Fitore Pazzoli Dalipi, and uh, also our young colleague, uh, Yeton Zulfai. So please, the floor is yours. You can present your paper. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Vittore Pazzoli, Yetan will join me in a second. Um, thank you for having us and we're trying in briefly to present what our paper is going to be. And uh, just one second, because I think we're having some issues. Okay. Okay, so um, our topic is the future of, um, I mean, the future in, in general, the future of the Western Balkans in the EU, in the European Union. But we've defined that there's a lack of trust and we're trying to find out. So our whether there is lack of trust between member states and the uh, um, EU, 
uh, states, um, member, member states in the EU and its citizens, and also the vice versa, uh, Western Balkan states and the people in Western Balkans. Um, and our title is uh, Lack of Trust, the Key Obstacle of Enlargement. So the focus of this paper is EU enlargement as the EU's instrument on foreign policy and its official framework for engagement with the Western Balkans region. Enlargement has uh, proven to be the EU's most influential uh, foreign policy instrument with regard to the future of members. Um, it is based on conditionality, which means that prospect members must fulfill certain conditions to become members of the EU. So the body criteria, known as the accession criteria, is supposed to be fair and unique, tailor-made for each country, but the process of evaluation is supposed to be merit-based and predictable, meaning that when criteria, given criteria are fulfilled, the EU should reward, uh, linking this way the speed of the membership with the country's uh, ability to fulfill criteria and meet conditions. Yet, so what uh, we have witnessed in the past decade is an asymmetrical approach towards different countries in the Western Balkans, both in setting the conditionality criteria and in the evaluation. This uh, asymmetrical approach has led to the EU to put harsher conditions and reward small carrots on some Western Balkan countries, while lighter conditions and big carrots for some other countries. So the prime example of this is the case of Serbia, which has taken all the carrots from the EU since 2008, when the uh, South uh, uh, Stability Association uh, entered into force, and uh, but who has moved further from the EU with each passing year. In 2019, uh, Freedom House uh, downgraded Serbia's status from a free country to partially free and from a partial. Uh, partial democracy to a hybrid regime. In another case, the EU has been able to deliver visa liberalization for Kosovo, has not, has been unable, sorry, to deliver visa liberalization for Kosovo, despite the Commission's consecutive pos positive evaluation reports since 2016, which apart from increasing mistrust, has also created um, Deep confusion. North Macedonia and Albania have both considered France veto to block the regional co uh, cooperation. Such developments have dramatically increased uh, mistrust among the public opinion in Western Balkan countries towards the EU. So um, and this mistrust seems to be mutual between the EU and the Western Balkan countries. Within the EU, there is a growing anti-Western Balkan feeling, which is demonstrated in the voting results of the European Parliament, where anti-immigrant and nationalist MPs vote against further negotiation for the Western Balkan countries at any given chance. A uh, similar pattern is shown also in the intergovernmental body of the EU Council, where we have seen some member states using veto against some Western Balkan countries, despite positive evaluation from the EU Commission. This paper suspects that there is growing mistrust between EU and Western Balkans among the elites, as well as the public opinion, which is undermining the progress of the membership of Western Balkan countries, but it is also damaging the credibility of the EU and the Western Balkans. Mistrust, in this case, is not only vis-à-vis -vis EU and Western Balkans, but also between EU institutions and member states with, with regard to Western Balkans. So this uh, was put on disarray by France, who took the initiative to propose new evaluation criteria for enlargement. These new criteria have already added the element that uh, any further enlargement must take into account the EU's readiness to enlarge and not just to be left out there waiting at the gate until the EU feels ready. Um, this paper asks and tries to answer whether the mistrust is based on facts such as presence of uh, high-level corruption, high unemployment, and broken justice system in the Western Balkan countries, 
or it is politically construct or is it it's a question politically constructed by elites within member states of the eu who talk to uh, who talk of western balkan citizens in derogatory and inflammatory language as drug traffickers immigrants and other differentiation terms as uh, is it a or another question is it a little of everything so as we try to answer such question we also examine eu's activeness and influence in the region and whether the current status quo and approach has created room for the actors such as Russia and China to grow their influence and increase their presence and uh, what will be the costs for both the EU and the Western Balkans. Well, I will pass to Yetan, so Yetan will carry on from here. Yeah. Um, it is uh, important, I, I think, to acknowledge that uh, the paper uh, considers that there is a status quo uh, in the relationship between the EU and uh, the Western Balkans. And uh, evaluation of the status quo uh, will come from the assessing the speed of advancement towards EU integration, which means how fast the region is approaching EU membership. And to that, to determine the status quo, we will look back at the previous enlargement waves and especially uh, in the Eastern Europe to see uh, whether the pace of the Western Balkans is somehow similar uh, to the previous waves. And that will sort of uh, give enough uh, evidence to, to show uh, what, is, uh, what, what kind of status quo uh, we have. I think it, it, it is a clear sign uh, of the status quo the initiative by the Western Balkan to create their own free trade area, which would serve as a substitute for the internal market. Uh, it, it seems like a miniature version of, of the EU, which would ultimately uh, slow down democratic reforms and the pace of EU membership, while at the same time it would create a hole in the middle of Europe for Chinese and Russian influence, and, and we have uh, already seen signs uh, of this. Our goal is to contribute through this paper uh, to the research agenda with regard to the US foreign policy, and in this case, uh, through enlargement, but also with regard to the Western Balkans, since the two are inextricably linked uh, through the membership process. Uh, we do so by analyzing uh, former and current research on the topic and by analyzing events and data. I think there have been a lot of events uh, which have demonstrated, uh, I mean, within EU and in the Balkans that have demonstrated both the status quo and, and, and where the relationship, uh, relationship stands. Um, as such, we believe uh, the paper can help both academic community and decision makers to orient their research and to reflect on the future uh, decisions. Uh, in doing so, we might end up posing more questions than we can provide answers for. And uh, we, in, in, in the theoretical framework, uh, we will, uh, in examining this status quo, uh, in the enlargement process, uh, we explore main theories on EU integration, such as new functionalism, intergovernmentalism, and post-functionalism. Uh, from a new functionalist perspective, uh, we focus on the power of uh, spillover, uh, and especially exogenous spillover uh, effect. Uh, to see how well uh, such theory is positioned to explain both the progress achieved so far and the current uh, stalemate or status quo. From an intergovernmentalist perspective, we explore whether the current status quo is due to member states putting brakes uh, on the enlargement simply because they don't see any further interest in enlarging the EU, or is it because they actually want to bargain harsher conditions uh, and rules, as we have seen uh, in the case of France? Uh, we look at the Putnam and uh, Moravzik two-level uh, approach, two-level game uh, approach, uh, to see how much domestic political processes within the EU impact decision-making at the EU level uh, with regard to the uh, enlargement process. 
uh, we suspect that uh, domestic issues within member states have played a determinant role in shaping EU's approach towards the Western Balkans, which is why we also explore the post-functionalist perspective, where we look whether identity politics have been a contributing factor to the current status quo. Here, we focus on the role of nationalism and issues such as immigration, uh, that might have played uh, in, in putting brakes uh, on the enlargement. Uh, we believe that these theories will not only help us explain the status quo, but help us also navigate uh, the way out. So we see them as complementary uh, uh, with each other and not uh, exclusive. So, uh, with that, uh, I think it's the floor open for question. We uh, this is where we're at. I think uh, there is a lot to uh, to look forward uh, in the paper, and uh, we are currently uh, in a very strange moment uh, in in this relationship uh, with the EU, where uh, at at one hand we have. Uh, European Union, who has been reluctant to deliver and also very uh, reluctant to play by the rules, uh, where we have had uh, conditions which have been far more rigorous for some countries and very uh, small carrots or no carrots, like in case of Kosovo. Uh, but then we have had very large carrots, let's say, for, for Serbia uh, in terms of um, the SAA, visa liberalization, and uh, the opening of the negotiations, and all the way while Serbia has actually reversed or backslided in, in, in key democratic uh, indicators. And this puts, uh, this make us sort of uh, question uh, the approach that EU has towards the evaluation. And rightly, this approach uh, has actually been uh, uh, criticized by France in the non-paper, which put the rule of law as a cross-cutting issue that you can actually backslide uh, anytime if you are not uh, showing any progress on this. But unfortunately, it, it seems like uh, Serbia and, and, and uh, for example, Montenegro, it, it, it is not yet very clear whether these two countries uh, are subject to this new revised methodology uh, uh, by the EU. But we are very concerned, uh, say, being uh, here from, from where we look, we are very concerned uh, how EU's actorness and influence uh, has uh, fallen out in, in the region. It was very high in 2011, for example, when uh, the EU was able to put both Kosovo and Serbia at the negotiating table and achieve uh, deals. It was quite a success for their uh, foreign policy. But now they have... Uh, they are very weak in, in this sense uh, because the, the, the trust that was put in them is sort of lost and the credibility that they had uh, is also sort of uh, lost in the region. So we have polls showing that the citizens in Kosovo, which were very pro-EU, uh, now uh, are, are losing uh, such trust uh, on the EU because let's say for like five years or there have been promises of visa liberalization, which is very, it's not even part of the EU integration process. But in any other thing, they have uh, quite simply failed to deliver when the technical criteria were met. So uh, this is uh, just recently, I mean, in, let's say in the, two, in the last two years, we see that the leaders in the Balkans uh, who have this autocratic leaning have come together to say, well, the EU rules are very tough. Let's make our own rules. Like, let's create our own Schengen area where we have uh, no 
have no 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 scrutiny uh, from the EU, and uh, we can we can escape this trap where we're at, and this weakens furthermore the EU's presence and and, and uh, influence in the region. So this is what the paper uh, will will look into and try to explain. Uh, why are we uh, where we are and how actually, uh, what is uh, the way out and what are the risks associated uh, both for the EU and the Western Balkans because uh, we already have an increased Chinese influence uh, in, in, in the Balkans. Thank you, dear colleagues, for this presentation. Uh, sorry to see uh, so much uh, lack of trust in your explanation of all these facts uh, summarized in this way. It looks like, but also we can discuss within us in the region uh, how many carers we receive or what are with sticks. But uh, let's try to, to uh, summarize somehow this, uh, this uh, discussion in our session with uh, one uh, general question maybe how you can comment it uh, try to make it a little more updated in this moment uh, we talk about uh, uh, we talk about the multi-annual action plan for the regional economic area we talk up about uh, next uh, sofia uh, skopje summit in early november we talk about uh, transforming of uh, mini schengen in for freedom initiative to integrate it in this multi-annual action plan. Albania, Serbia and uh, Ma uh, Macedonia were for that. Uh, Montenegro was not. But now with this Washington agreement, Kosovo is also in this process. And what now with Bosnia and Montenegro? Of course that we will also join. So I expect in a November summit in Sofia that I will see all six administration, economies, country, whatever, together signing by governments that new multi-annual action plan. Uh, having this good experience with the uh, speed corridors during the COVID crisis for the medical equipments and the key uh, food stuff for the region, uh, and with this incentive of economic and uh, uh, investment plan, uh, promising uh, 9 billion for our region. I expect that it could be some good incentive for further dialogue between the countries towards EU, not to reallocate paths regionally, but to strengthen at least story about economy. So in this context of European perspective, approaching to that next summit, do you think that there are enough place for understanding of importance of economic integration for the time being. So my question is, let's talk a little about economic aspect of integration. Maybe we, we then balance better all these political differences. So do you think that there are some chances for us if we could talk about economic integration for the benefits of all? So question is for all, of course. Please uh, give us your final comments. Uh, no, yes. Professor, uh, sorry, uh, Mr. Petrovic, can you shortly comment this at least small piece of optimism? Sorry, please unmute your microphone. Sorry about that. Um, I, I only follow the economic integration aspect, uh, so to say, peripherally. My, my chief domain of interest is the political, uh, I, uh, political aspect of integration in the neighborhood policies and the enlargement policies. Uh, well, if, if you ask me wh whether, it, whether I believe it's a good thing, I do. I, I do think that it's uh the it could be uh the thing that could uh, stimulate uh developments of further ties in the region or uh, re-establishing the old ones so i i wouldn't comment mu much more about that uh, because we uh on the on one hand we have this good economic proposition on the other hand uh we have uh 
uh, this. Uh, you are probably familiar with the Regional Cooperation Council's public survey, uh, which is published each year. Uh, this year, um, the two most pessimistic uh, countries re regarding the Euro optimism are the leaders in the EU accession process. Serbia, in Serbia, only 26% of the of those who were questioned in the survey believe that the eu integration is a good thing and uh the eu integration played a marginal part in the eu elections uh, in, in the national elections this year which is also very uh, a very big change and the second uh, country is montenegro where around 50 percent of the respondents uh were uh, uh were uh, in favor of EU integration, but uh, th it is very uh, symptomatic that the leaders in the EU integration process are their own uh, constituencies uh, are uh, are discouraged by it. Thank you, Mr. Petrovic. Please, uh, Professor Pakolas, what do you think about all these processes? About We got to mute. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. About economic integration. Uh, uh, it's my feeling that uh, economic integration is not the head of the matter. Because, and that is uh, the trap for the Western Balkans. Because it seems to me that underlying uh, the rationale underlying the French proposal, uh, as exposed by Mr. Hleba. Uh, is to integrate um, the, uh, uh, integrate the Western Balkan state into the single market, but without becoming full members. Uh, tomorrow or the day or the day after tomorrow, sometime the the Western Balkans will fulfill this uh, condition of uh, to integrate themselves into the single market. The question mark is if they can become members, full members of the European Union. And so, at least for me, the emphasis should not be given to the economic integration, it should be given to uh, uh, the process uh, of uh, accessions. Uh, and that uh, was uh, an, an event, and even uh, Mr. Kleba, for instance, drew a very optimistic I think uh, a very optimistic uh, conclusion on the revised methodology proposed, uh, which is uh, uh, suggested by the European uh, Commission uh, and uh, in its uh, latest report. Uh, it seems to me that it makes things uh, more difficult or make things uh, uh, worse in a sense that the underlying is the rationale to ingrain into the whole Accession process, not on economic integration, uh, and the whole pro the accession process, uh, the, the French uh, goal, that is, or the French logic, that is, that uh, membership is not the only form of relationship. So, what are the other forms? Integrating and becoming partners of the single market. And that is, uh, I think, from uh, at least uh, on from your side, you must be very careful uh, uh, on that, because the tragic will be that uh, at the time when the UK uh, exit the European uh, the European Union, it left its mark on the European uh, integration. But it reminds you that the Europe the UK uh, was. Uh, is and has been fond of the economy of the single market, not of uh, becoming the European Union of, of, uh, of the EU becoming a single uh, unified uh, polity. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for this friendly advice. <laughs> uh, let's talk about uh, balances between those two processes. Uh, Mr. Hleba, can you add something more? Yes, yes, I will. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, just echoing um, the statement of Professor F Fakiolas, uh, what he said about French uh, 
uh, view on the enlargement. So not only membership is on the table, there are different other formats that are possible. It reminded me of uh, Romano Prodi's statement on the ENP, all but institutions. So you can have all types of integration, but you can, but you will not be at the table, at this decision-making table in, in Brussels. And this seems to resonate uh, with, with uh, President Macron's uh, latest, at least, statements on the enlargement. When it comes to economics and economic integration as such, if you look at the EU, everything started with a political project of bringing peace and prosperity to Europe. And then economics followed with the customs union, and then it took decades to achieve single market monetary union not even now for all of the countries schengen area uh, as well only in 1995 i believe uh was was introduced so if you look at the region as such uh, the balkans we need to see um for instance intra-region trade versus western balkans countries trade with the eu because if you look at the intra-region trade i i believe the volumes are not comparable to the eu so it's uh, of course even if, if it comes to infrastructure and connectivity energy uh there, there is there is a certain uh, potential in the in the region but it but inevitably it will be integrated into the single market uh, of the eu rather than have its own regional economic area because all countries have FTAs with the EU so now they cannot themselves have another customs union let's say because then they would need to renegotiate and have this one trade deal with the with the EU uh, when it comes to US involvement since it was mentioned about uh, economic integration well Trump simply played on the pre-election agenda trying to 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 be seen in media as a peacemaker in the Balkans uh, this is what he inevitably did, also involving Israel and uh, moving of the embassy to Jerusalem, recognition of Kosovo. Uh, so it was simply, as I see it, it was a pre-election uh, move for him. Uh, and we will see what will be the consequences for, for the Balkans as such, but uh, regrettably they are used as a political tool because I don't believe that Trump is generally interested in that. He, he showed in his foreign policy rather Israel it, isolation uh, type uh, foreign policy when it comes to Syria and many other places. So out of a sudden he decided to be proactive uh, in the Balkans. So uh, to, to wrap it up, I would say indeed when it comes to reconciliation, energy connectivity, infrastructure transfer, there is a lot to be done, but politics is still in place. And inevitably when it comes to either border disputes or some other unsolved uh, issues between even um, uh, countries in the Western Balkans, political solution is needed. Thank you. Thank you for sharing us your uh, thinking about that. Uh, do we have with us here still Professor Regis? Please, Professor. Hello. Hello, yes. La a final comment? Um. I'm 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 a, I'm a European I'm a, I'm a, I'm a fan of a, of a economic integration um theory That's my which, track. <laughs> as, as 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 it has been applied in the European Union now if we if we go beyond that and enter this uh, dark room of of defense and political integration then things are actually becoming very difficult and I, I'm, I'm not sure that there, there have been, or today there, there we, we, we actually have the preconditions for, for political and defense integration. And, um, even, even if we talk about military security uh, or non-military security, which is, which is another, another important issue, um, the internal uh, homeland security of European Union, these uh, these these uh, parameters actually, in my view, are, are 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 conflicting with the economic aspects or classical economic aspects of uh, European integration. So, in my view, this project of 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 uh, initiating European integration in economic terms, which is a market customs integration, and then actually um, uh, turning this project into a political. Um, um, not, not to speak about defense or military integration, then that, that project would be easily, um, more easily uh, implemented and uh, actually uh, feasible. Uh, so in my view, we, we are still in, a, in, a, in a, we're still facing a dilemma, uh, which, which, wh whether way to go. 
um, I, I, I'm, I'm not I'm not very confident that uh, political integration is, um, is is actually uh, is actually flourishing or actually uh, having uh, any any future at all. So um, uh, pessimistic uh, um, um, think we we should uh, in a way going back or or emphasize the 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 economic or um, or you know economic or customs um, a, a union as it used to be in the beginning. Um, n n not really, not really uh, um, uh, um, seeing the the preconditions, as, as I said before, about the um, the political uh, the political union or a single a single European uh, um, state or a single European uh, defense entity. Um, that's that's my that's my that's my overall concluding view. Thank you, Professor, for that comment. And we have still time for uh, our colleagues. Uh, Jeton, you will talk. Uh, yes, well, thank you for uh, the comments. And uh, uh, we, we are pessimistic, I guess, uh, because, uh, look, as I said, in, in 2011, uh, EU was quite uh, there. And uh, if, if you look in the region, we had Rambouillet, you know, in, in 1999, and then we had 2005 and seven Vienna negotiations. And when you look who was uh, in those negotiations, EU was at the back, uh, it wasn't at the front. So basically uh, Serbia didn't trust EU to, to, to lead, uh, to mediate the negotiations, and they wanted Russia always. And we never sat at a table without the United States. But in 2011, for the first time, we both sort of trusted the European Union to do the right thing, and we sat at a table without uh, the United States. They were at the back. And we, this was enormous for the EU in its foreign policy to actually tackle the problems in their backyard and, and to take charge. And, and it felt like EU is this very powerful actor. But looking back, now 10 years after, where are we? Uh, we, we went to Washington and uh, for us, for Kosovo, it was sort of natural to put trust on on the United States uh, to lead uh, any process. But given the Trump administration, uh, a lot of uh, dots uh, are now raised. And uh, I must say that no party here has supported uh, this mini Schengen uh, idea, none. And it was only, as I agree uh, with uh, Leba, that uh, it was enormous pressure to please the administration uh, in, in, in Washington uh, with this a la carte agreement, because you can find everything in that agreement. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's not about one thing. You can find all, all, all condemning Hezbollah and then talking about Mini Schengen and for, for the lesbians. And so you have everything in an agreement which it was negotiated in a day. And uh, here, there are many people reluctant. I do understand, and of course, we do understand that there is uh, our major trade partners are in, in the region. But frankly, Kosovo is not exporting that much to benefit uh, from uh, uh, from this uh, agreement. But what we see as a problem is that we will lower our ambitions, and uh, we will not have the incentives to speed up the reforms that are needed. And uh, this, this will only worsen the problems that we already have. We don't think that the answer is less EU and let's deal with ourselves and our problems are not entirely economic. Uh, I'm sure, of course, it worked for Germany and France to tie themselves and then the rest of the Europe with, with the economics. But that was only done because the Germans took responsibility of what happened. And there, there was this, let's move on because we are 
you know, we are to be blamed for what, what happened and we're going to accept this. There is no acceptance in the Balkans for what has happened and there is no full reconciliation in the political end. So politics is still determining uh, the, 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 what the economics uh, will look like. So it's, it's, you cannot, you, you, we still have mis, huge mistrust between uh, one another, especially, I would say, in the case of uh, Kosovo and Serbia. So there is huge mistrust uh, because the past is still the present. And uh, moving to this economic uh, sort of uh, free trade area, it's highly unlikely and very, and, and with many dots. Uh, but overall, uh, it is sort of uh, a, a, a movement which would uh, lessen EU's presence uh, in the Balkans. And uh, that, is, that is something that we have to look at what, what does that mean. I mean, with this huge presence, especially economic presence of the China in the region, which is looking for their own model to expand trade and it is not very com in compliance with the EU rules and, but it could be in compliance with uh, mini schengen rules because they will not be as tougher as as e rules so it in you, you might see uh, that uh, this could be uh, this, this could potentially be a big problem in the future that instead of bringing us closer to you it would just drive us uh, apart Thank you for sharing this uh, final comments regarding relation between uh, political aspect of integration, uh, security integration and economic integration. Uh, maybe having these uh, different uh, voices about uh, uh, what is what is priority, what we will do with uh, with economic integration if it will be an issue very soon. Um, I like to thank you all of you for this uh, participation and for sharing all of this uh, uh, new research uh, with uh, our colleagues and participants of this conference. With uh, these comments, I think we we are a little more on, with the time. Time management is not always an issue on the Western Balkan, but okay, let's continue with our conference and thank you from uh, all of us from our session.